So I'm Bob Good. I'm uh, an internal medicine physician at uh, uh, in Carl Health Systems in Central Illinois, past president of ACOI, and welcome to you all to Solid on this, I guess, autumn evening in October. Mm -hmm. It's a good thing this isn't on thanks on Halloween because I'd be afraid what Dr. Rao should be doing to us. <laughs> So anyway, welcome to you all. Uh, those of you who made it to the convention, we're very pleased that you were able to be there. And those of you who weren't, next year, you get to come. So um, tonight, uh, we're going to start out with uh, Dr. Rausch, who's going to have some words of wisdom for us and concerns us some, some serious topics. So Laura, I'm going to turn this over to you. Laura is Hello. a former dean at uh, Kansas City Joplin at... Uh, Oh, you can introduce for all the places you've been, Laura. Oh, I've been everywhere, man. Everywhere. <laughs> but I'm a true DO at heart, true DO internist at heart. It's so lovely to see everyone. And the only thing that would be better than this is to see you in person, because we all know that 80% of our communicating is done non-verbally. So why our body language and how we talk and how we stand and all that other jazz. So it's hard to say. I think, Kara, are you going to be able to put up my slides? I know I, I'll, I'll flip through slides really quickly and then we're going to have a nice discussion. And then Dr. Good's going to give us some words of wisdom because I love hearing from Dr. Good too. We've got some seriously smart internists hanging out and I'll tell you what, internists are amazing. So you pick the right place to be. What I'm going to talk to you about a little bit is how to maintain your good health for you and your classmates. I went through uh, medical school um, probably with a chronic state of dysthymia. Um, it, it probably was smoldering before I got there because I was worried about having grades, worried about getting into medical school. And then you finally get in and then you start going through medical school and you realize, wow, this is hard. And I'm surrounded by a bunch of smart people. And nobody ever really talked in the 80s about mental health. It was just the thing. We Everything was like the Bobby Knight approach. You just suck it up or somebody was going to throw a chair at you. So I love that we can have dialogues and we can talk about some of this stuff without fear of repercussions. Because to recognize when you're under a severe stressor, such as medical school or going through residency, that... Um, the symptoms of, of depression and emotional disturbances can manifest. And it's a, it's a way to um, sort of gauge uh, how you can handle the situation and learn more about yourself. So what I'm gonna try, my whole point is gonna be two points mostly for the whole talk, that you are valuable and you are so loved and you are so important. And there are so many people rooting for you from the bottom of my heart, I swear that that exists. All, all the people who have showed up in this meeting tonight are some of them, but it's just a small sampling, for example, of members of our American College of Osteopathic Internists who will be there for you. So first of all, off, understand you are valuable. You are so loved. We want you to be successful. Your, your professors, even though they can act like dorks sometimes, they want you to be successful. Your classmates want you to be successful. Your families want you to be successful. So to pay attention to um, what's around you and what's around in the environment. And, 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 and from the bottom of my heart, I mean that. The second thing I think that's important to be able to understand is that there's resources for you. And what a really wise person learns to do, and it, it took me till I was this old, okay, I'm very old. But when you get older, you realize that um, really you live it. You hear it that, oh, adversity is just going to be a thing that helps you to learn a strategy for managing it. And as you get older and wiser, you recognize, you learn to separate yourself from the feelings and the events that happen around you. And what I pray and hope and wish for everyone that goes through a stressful experience like medical school or um, you know, any, other, any number of things that can occur to you throughout your life that are stressful is that you view it as an opportunity to learn, really view it as an opportunity to learn because infinitely throughout my career, What's made me a better person has been all the things I didn't get and all the failures that I did make and all um, the things that I learned more about myself to persevere through. It is really, really, really true. And there's not a successful person in the room that you know in your whole life that couldn't tell you that story. So let's flip to the next one, Kara. Nothing to disclose, no commercial support. Nobody's paying me for this. 
learning objectives, recognize the signs and symptoms of mental health decline in your fellow students and yourself, and then also to familiarize yourself with some of the strategies to mitigate mental health decline for you and your classmates. Next slide. Medical school is exhausting. As I said, if you're gonna have like two pivot point stress points in your life, at least for me from recollection, one was medical school itself. Internship was bad, residency was not a cakewalk. But medical school was one and then having kids would be the other one. Those are two big stressors that you go through. And I love this, sta this statement by Steve, life doesn't get any easier or more forgiving. We are resilient. Really, I want you to, again, as I said in, in my little monologue in the beginning, the opportunity to learn more about yourself in the world. This is a, it's a stress test, right? It's a mental, emotional, physical, psychological relationship um, stress test. And, and not that I think you need to be like David Groggins. And if you don't know who David Groggins is, write that name in the margin of a piece of paper and Google that guy and look him up. He, he is quite the perseverant gentlemen and not anyone could get to that point and we and the whole world would look like a crybaby next to him but it, it, this is an opportunity to learn more about yourself in the world and to get better at something it's also a chance to develop coping mechanisms right that will that you will ingrain as part of your armamentarium to last the rest of your life because being a physician is is just chock full of challenges every corner you turn around you're going to be challenged by nursing, by administrative issues in the hospital, by community resources out in the environment, by patients who are challenging. So this is the time in your life where you know you're deeply loved, you have supportive faculty, staff, parents, friends, peers that are there to be able to support you on your, your journey. So seize this opportunity. Next slide. Mental health issues and others in yourself. Next slide. So some of the things that do develop, and these are normal when you're under a period of stress. This is totally normal. Sleep, sleep sleepiness, um, being tired, being exhausted from poor sleep schedules, staying up a little bit later than you should, studying, trying to take a test or get up the next day on four hours of sleep, having poor sleep from an, an inability to be able to disengage from the thought processes throughout the day, Impaired vigilance is another uh, symptom of um, a behavioral symptom of mental health is hyper either you become hyper vigilant or sort of lackadaisical and don't pay focus that much attention on it. And those kind of issues are sort of the subtle behavioral changes that you'll begin to see. Next slide, Kara. Some of the changes also that you can see more globally and in some of your classmates and your peers, and maybe even in yourself, it's a little bit of truancy showing up late. I always look at my my faculty and my doctors that work for me. And if there's a chronic pattern where they're showing up late, there's sort of a subliminal reluctance to be able to show up or fear or issue that they might be grappling with that hasn't been identified. And being late or not showing up is one of those um, presenting behavioral things. Substance use is another one. I say everything but coffee. Coffee, if they ever say coffee is a bad substance, we're gonna be in trouble because I lived on coffee. But Alcohol use, um, drugs, uh, too much stimulants, not prescribed stimulants. Not completing tasks is another uh, change that you might be able to see. You'll even find it in yourself. You'll mean to clean your house up or put your clothes away or maybe get that, get, get that visit to get your hair or nails done and you're not quite completing things that are like self-care related things. Isolation, you tend to isolate your peers, your colleagues, some of your friends might uh, self-isolate. You'll see people that'll have outbursts. And, you know, we probably feel we notice ourselves even on the edge at times from the lack of sleep, from the frustration, from the inability to function at the level we think that we should be functioning, which can be absurd with four hours of sleep for three days in a row and stressors to try to pass examinations that are important and pivotal to our future and our career. Poor grades in yourself or in your classmates can also be a symptom and as well as ob observation of people's facial, facial expressions and their body language. I'm a big facial expression body language person. Somebody who can engage by looking in their eyes or talking to them as I indicated before, 80% of the way we communicate is nonverbal. Next slide. If your heart's broken, make art out of the pieces. Isn't that beautiful? please, your heart will be broken many, many, many times throughout your pathway. 
we are here to support you. We are here to tell you that you're fantastic and that um, there is light at the end of the tunnel and even the vicissitudes that you will encounter are survivable. This is a, another wonderful philosophy. Um, it's a Japanese tradition. It's called Kintsugiri. I, can't, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. You may have heard of it. Put that note in your margin and look it up. Some of the beautiful artwork and pottery. There's also was like a Hallmark movie with uh, that name, Kintsugiri, and that's what prompted me to sort of look up and try to understand more. It's a, it's a, it's actually where the Japanese will take broken pottery and they repair it with the gold and silver. Uh, welding and the pottery piece itself becomes more beautiful. And throughout the throughout uh, our lives, as our lives carry on, we become more broken or more challenged. That we it gets repaired with these beautiful artworks and these inlays, and they become more beautiful than the re, than the original and more valuable. As you are. Next slide. You may have to fight a battle more than once to win it. I, my buddy Margaret Thatcher, isn't that the truth? But it, it's actually the process itself of going towards something that's quite an exciting and wonderful adventure. And if, one of the things I could say to myself, and sometimes I was very stubborn and very egomaniacal as a student, I kept thinking that my, the way I would study was the right way. This is the way. This is what Edger Kovic does. And this is the way I'm going to study. And I would still continue to maybe get the same outcome in exams. And what you need to learn is that there's a different there's a different modus operandi and it opens you up to different opportunities and different ways of looking at things, just in the same as when you take care of patients and you practice medicine. So learning to adapt to, um, to find a different strategy will open and that's, that's what medical school will afford to you. Next slide, Karen. Some of the basic things you need to do, and here's some of the strategies I want you all to adopt. Everyone should adopt this because you're gonna be telling your patients to do this and you need to do it yourself. You need to sleep. You need to eat healthy food. You need to do routine body maintenance sorts of things, like take time to go to the bathroom, right? Um, I can't tell you. I know this is just going to sound like a silly little thing, and maybe it's just me, but I noticed when sometimes when I was on call, I would not go to the bathroom right away, or I would go and maybe not empty my full bladder and come out and just be feeling miserable. So taking the op opportunity to do sort of the routine maintenance sorts of things that you need to do for yourself. Exercise. I'll tell you that even if you exercise at five minute intervals throughout a day, you say, I have five minutes to be able to do something, maybe five minutes of squats, five minutes of abdominal exercises, five minutes of stretching, all those add up. From a physiologic standpoint, they're beneficial to the body. So if you have an opportunity to go stretch, do it. Reflection, that means being mindful. Individuals who are more mindful and reflect on their mood and their memory and come to know themselves can, can cooperate better with some of the vicissitudes that you'll encounter. Sur searching for social support. I think probably one of the best things in medical school is you look around at the people who are going to be your future colleagues and peers and your friends and to maintain those connections, the social support that you get, because everyone in your class is going through a lot of the same struggles that you might be going through. And this is the social support is pivotal. Support from your family. Some families, maybe not so much, but some families much. And look at that, look at those opportunities for individuals who can support you. And then also, um, I was watching my daughters at Berkeley and she, dove in in a pre-medical curriculum that was way, way too challenging, way over her head. And she said, mom, I really just put myself in too deep. She ended up dropping one of her science classes, but th this was so interesting and I'll never forget it. She said, I'm going to order a new sweater on Amazon. Is that okay? Of course, honey. She said, because I feel better when I put on a new sweater and I, I can go. And that was just a small little thing, but grooming yourself, getting your nails done, getting your hair done, um, you know, shaving, if, if whatever you need to do, these little basic ADLs are all things that are strategies that, that you need to keep on, especially during times of stress. You are worth it, you deserve it, and please make sure that that's part of your schedule. Um, some of the th other things that you can do, and you're going to say, I don't have time to, but you do not not have time to not take care of yourself. And all these things I listed below are sort of self-care behaviors that are re-nurturing and that are pivotal and important for you to be able to uh, be a successful physician and to be able to perform at your optimal. You can go for periods of time without, you know, social things and 
um, maybe exercising for short periods. But in general, these are the kind of foundational things that you need to in, inculcate into your schedule right at this point so that when you're out and you're practicing in a busy practice and taking care of people that you have a, a mechanism in place built in no matter how short, it's not gonna always be the same how you might think it should be, but reflect back on these basic ADLs because they're, they're gonna be important and they're gonna be an anchor for which you can latch onto and, and handle stressful pursuits. Next slide. Always, always set realistic goals. Um, one of the things that I have a tendency to do and I still even do it, I will cram 59 things into my little schedule. And I still keep a paper schedule because I'm old. You can't see that. But to set realistic goals, can you really drive to the store, pick up all the groceries, return the dry cleaning, take the dog to the groomer in 90 minutes? Can you really do that in the city of Chicago? Can you do it even in medical school? Can you study for this, <laughs> do that homework, take the dog here, go brush my teeth, visit the dentist? And, and just keeping those goals realistic, being mindful, one of the ways that I, it's been suggested in all the literature is to keep a journal. Um, meditation is one way um, as well that can be very uh, re reflective and um, thought provoking so that you get involved deeply in what the internal dialogue is, that little um, person that lives inside of your head and talks to you with the chatter throughout the day. Um, and I'm not talking like, uh, you know, like a crazy kind of chatter, but it's just a chatter like, okay, um, you did good there, you answered that question and I'm very proud of it. Or, oh, um, I screwed that up, boy, I'm a dumb person. You really need to pay attention to that little voice because if you listen to too much of the negativity and you don't meditate and reflect on that voice, it's more difficult to stop it and you create a pattern of doing that. So it's very important to recognize an internal dialogue and these are some of the mechanisms they can do it by being mindful, by journaling, by meditating and by some people by praying. If you notice that you're having a little struggle, there is no shame. And this is a, the set. Some people are very good at finding coping strategies and they can get them on their own. And sometimes you need to talk to somebody. And the people that you can talk to, and I can say this from personal experience, they can look at your dilemma from a third party perspective and give you answers and give you solutions that you might not otherwise think of because you've been living in a, in a glass bubble. Um, you come up always with a game plan. If you realize, for example, you're struggling with a particular class that you develop a game plan and a flow sheet of how to address that issue, that you don't ignore it and think, oh, I'll do better on the next test or, oh, I'll do better in this next situation or, oh, this attending doesn't like me. I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna just deal with it. You come up with an actual strategic game plan because believe me, it goes back to my first statement. You are worth it. And it is very important that you learn how to do this because once you do, it will carry over into when you're in attending and, and taking care of people and playing in the, in the big ball game. Exercising yoga is, what I love about yoga is that it's a mindful activity and it's also exercising. So it takes care of that internal thought dialogue, but it also stretches and rejuvenates the body. And then always go back and reflect into your ADLs. Did you eat? Did you sleep? There's a saying that my girlfriend taught me. I didn't know what it was because I'd never been involved in Alcoholics Anonymous and her dad had been an alcoholic and she went to AA. She said, Laura, and I remember complaining when I was in med school. She said, Laura, never let yourself get too hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. The acronym is HALT. Hungry, angry, lonely, and tired. And that's kind of the backup plan to go to. Am I hungry? Am I angry at somebody or angry with myself? Am I lonely? Am I feeling isolated? Or am I really tired? Tired can make your thinking so distorted that sometimes you just need to get, you know, the eight hours or 10 hours of sleep so that you're able to function. Next slide. Healthy habits, planning ahead, having a checklist and prioritizing some of the things. You let, I have sometimes a lot of checklists with about a thousand things on it but to take a step back and which ones are really the priority and they should be the time that you use to keep your own health going. Social time, sleeping, eating healthy, shopping, buying appropriate food and eating well because you deserve it and asking for help. Peer support's lovely. Faculty, you've got great faculty and I know for, for fact that the faculty at Joplin 
uh, campus for KCU is phenomenal. You hang out with friends. Oh, and Carol's here. So the ones in Kansas City are amazing too. I didn't want to just <laughs> separate the two. Be kind to yourself and others. Um, keep yourself hydrated. Do all the grooming sorts of things that you need to do to yourself. Another good strategy is to delegate the, the items that you really can't get to. Like say you're living and you have a dog and you know your cousin lives down the street and he needs to get to the groomer or go to the vet for or get his teeth pulled. You delegate those responsibilities. This is the other interesting thing that um, I, I didn't fully appreciate. I would say to myself, why do I feel so much better at work? People would say to me, you're at work all the time. You really work a lot, Laura. But what I realized and, and this was like in the early 90s, and I hadn't done a lot of mental health reading and understanding um, the relationship physiologically between um, depression, anxiety, mental health, good deeds, and what it's the physio physiologic changes associated with. When you help someone, you create a whole cascade of feel-good hormones inside, your, inside yourself. And you're kind to people, it releases serotonin, oxytocin, and those pathways are laid down. And it provides a feedback loop that's, that acts as almost like an antidepressant that's able to help you so that as the more that you help someone else and you help other people, that you create that opportunity for your body physiologically to mold and change. And being a physician, wow, you're going to have that opportunity day in and day out. But one thing I want you to remember is doctor, you need to take care of yourself first, okay? Because if you don't take care of yourself and you're not checking in with yourself, it's gonna be a challenge for you to take care of other people. So keep that in your back pocket and remember it, even in medical school, learn those skills. And as you go through and you do become a resident and an attending physician, these will be helpful. Next slide. And these are just some famous quotes that I really liked. It's not your reaction nor the adversity that determines your life story, how your life story will develop. So that's how your reaction is. Care for yourself so that you may provide care to others. Medical school is that opportunity. You'll get new skills, you'll be successful, be open to change. Next slide. I love this one. Now there's a guy that's been through some serious stuff, huh? And it is true. Do not judge me by the fact that I had all these successes that, you know, I've done all these great accolades. I'm chairman of this and on the board of that, president of, you know, who cares what. Look at the person and how many times they've had to brush their knees off and stand up and keep going forward. Next slide, Kira. Yes, you will be changed by what happens to you in medical school and you will not be reduced by it. And one more. Is that it? Are we out? Questions. Yay, I got it in under 30 minutes. <laughs> Let's all get back together as a group. I'm, I'm tired of looking at my own face. <laughs> I know when you give these presentations, you're talking to like this black screen. <laughs> Is that all stuff you already knew? Did I just bore you for the last 20 minutes? That's 20 minutes you'll never get back. <laughs> Dr. Raj was a very high yield of 20 minutes. Don't worry. I felt like back I was in medical school with you. you know, it was awesome. I think a lot of times people need to hear it though, Dr. Roche, and I don't think that everybody hears it at the same time. And you know, you never know when you're gonna hit somebody because I'm all about journaling and I didn't used to be, you know, when I was younger. And then when you go back and read some of the things you wrote when you you put this in the journal, it's a type of therapy. You let it out. But then when you go back and read it a year later, you realize it was really nothing. You know, so you it does help to it. do these things. Oh, absolutely. Uh, something. Absolutely. Oh, sorry. I was a little delayed. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Uh, something I would yes. like to add is, you know, just, of course, you know, I'm a second year resident. So I, at least I, I remember very fondly of, for one of my wonderful times with Dr. Rosh, but also, I remember the really hard times that it is for medical school, but some important things that you should realize is that you don't have to be perfect. And what I mean by that is that there are going to be plenty of times where in medical school, you feel pressure. You feel pressure that you need to be at the very top. You shouldn't falter. You shouldn't cry. You shouldn't be angry. However, 
it's not that, you know, despite you crying, you still are a phenomenal student. You're still a phenomenal learner. So don't ever be hard on yourself. Always ask people around. I ask a ton of people around me. So many people. It's, uh, I always had, um, I felt like I was with the most stellar classmates and they are so ridiculously smart. They do like a thousand Anki cards every day. And that gives me just nightmares even till now. But even then it's still realizing that you are incredible. And things what Dr. Raj said about the little activities, for instance, I always made it a point for me. It was like the really weird things, right? Like I need to make my bed every single day when I woke up. That was my first victory. It was like the first thing. It's like, you know, why you making your bed, you are establishing for the day that like, okay, my life is going to be organized. And then in the morning too, I always would state three things I was especially very grateful for because that kind of helped my mindset before I even would start school. Um, so it's the, as what Dr. Rajri said, those small little things you do, you don't realize it. But being in medical school, you feel like time flies and you drown with all the work, even though you don't realize it. But those little actions, you realize how much better your mental health is, because I can attest for it. Could I ask, um, by using the uh, reactions and a hand to flag, how many of you either know someone or have had somebody in your class or school commit suicide? Got some hands that have gone up. So, um, got some more hands going up. That's good. So, you know, Laura, you might want to address, we, you know, every year we lose about an entire medical school class with students committing suicide. It's about 200 plus, depends on the year. So, Laura, you want to just address that a little bit, what you might want to be watching for? Yes. Um, all those symptoms that I talked about with isolation, outbursts, um, lack of test completion, disinterest, disengagement, outbursts, those are some of the minor ones. But I can tell you of the two residents that I lost while I was a program director, they were in a different program, but I knew of them. There were no symptoms. People had worked with them, lurked alongside of them, and they came to work and put on a good face right? Just like uh, Robin Williams. A lot of times people are depressed or lonely or isolate themselves and then they come to work and they're all, it's difficult to recognize. I had one patient that I also lost to suicide and I'd taken care of her for about two years and never, never would have ever absorbed. And I view myself as more of an empath and it, it really shook me to the core to not be able to recognize that. It's kind of like saying, even when you'll ask them, do you have a plan or do you uh, know um, someone that, you know, you, they will even say no, right? They don't even self-disclose that information for fear of not being able to practice medicine or complete their work. So I think um, at least having a handle on some of those, those signs that I mentioned before, the isolation, the outbursts, mood changes, um, appetite, ADL activity, lack of taking care of themselves. Those are some of the perhaps more subtle ones that can occur, but need to be focused on. Can anybody else think of anything, Carol? Yeah. Well, I just wanted to raise the point, Laura, that I think your comments about sometimes you can't tell is so important for the survivors because um, I would venture that I don't, I didn't see all the hands, but I would bet everyone has been touched directly or indirectly. And um, I think that that's, that's the grace talking about giving ourselves grace and knowing how much we're loved that should that happen to one of our, even a close friend or a relative that the pain and the, the illness and the dis disastrous situation that they're in goes so deep that we may never be able to tell. And to not torture yourselves, because it always comes to mind, what did I miss? What didn't I see? You know, what didn't I hear? 
Did I sh should I call it a couple more times? And uh, I think we've all many of us have been through that. And um, you just sometimes you can't tell. Yeah, I mean, it, in medical school is a time, first of all, you're surrounded by extremely people that are extremely successful, mm -hmm. academically, creative, creative, creativity. Um, and they're, we are all really good at covering up, right? Um, but there's also a condition called bipolar disorder, which sometimes people don't really realize until we get into medical school. And I think that um, they may be having manic phases long before they develop a severe depressive phase. So I I just be watchful of each other because that's we're we're a medical team out there that watch and care for each other. Um, and, and I think some of the things that Laura talked about, it's it's great to share and support each other. That's what we need to do. Any other questions or comments for Laura? You brought up the journal right here is my 1973 journal. Before the is that when you stopped? <laughs> uh, it's not, but it's 50 years ago. So I've been watching what I did 50 years ago, um, you know, each day. So you guys might just kind of keep that in mind as a way to entertain yourself when you get 50 years later. Okay, Laura, anything else that you'd like to add? Thank you very much. No, thank you. You're lovely. I, I do say that a lot to the students. I think to for them to know you are so loved and you are so valuable. You really are. You really are. Right. Any other comments? Anybody's got any comments? Just raise your hand on the uh, reaction phase there. We'll be glad to see that. Okay. All right. Very good. Well, I'm going to do something a little different tonight. So if you can flip. Oh, you got a hand raised. Go ahead, Selena. I'm sorry. Um, so I guess I was just wondering if someone could touch upon like, okay, I'll, I'll start like this. So, I mean, we, at least um, in Joplin, have a lot of support in terms of student services and like mental health club, which I'm also a part of and find really important. And we do fun stuff like we've got hot chocolate bar um, planned next month and just little things to kind of keep the spirits up or change things up and just give ourselves that peace and break um, in this journey. And I was wondering what that's like once you're out in the workforce and in the hospital and like, do things like that still happen? Or does, what does that look like in, in the workforce type of thing? Well, I think um, if you don't learn to manage uh, stressful, um, stressful states and manage emotion and have um, the opportunity to be reflective and know yourself. And if that, it's kind of like if you have a habit a certain way and it just grows into, it follows you around your whole life. Because we all, we all have been adolescents, right? So think of how you were when you were an adolescent before you learned effective coping strategies emotionally and mentally. And it carries on and it does carry through in attendings right? When they become, you become a full practicing physician. And in fact, it might even get worse, right? Because sometimes I'm the doctor and I'm in charge and I have the power. And to be able to realize that they have the emotional intelligence of a four-year-old, but then they're like a 46-year-old man who never evolved behind. That does happen. That's a thing, April. I want you to know that does happen. You might go, I remember being felt, I didn't know what gaslighting was, but as a resident, I remember being talked to inappropriately and I thought, well, he's the surgeon, he knows everything. So I'm just gonna shut up and back down. And now when I think about it, I thought, wow, wow. So that's why I say you are, you are loved, you are valuable, your opinion matters. You know what the dealio is, you are learning. 
And should someone ever judge you or criticize you or put you down or label you, do anything like that and be other than supportive, that's on them. Okay, they should not be teaching students, in my opinion. So um, yes, it does carry on to adulthood. You'll see it in full color, Celine, and you'll you'll reflect back. And maybe when you're an attending, you'll go back and you'll be a psychiatrist and you'll help that person. So <laughs> I think the I other thing say, that's very Sorry, go, go ahead, ahead, go ahead Susan. No, go ahead. I was just going to say the other thing that I think is very important um, is for you to realize whatever your passion is, don't give it up. Yeah. You know, keep, if you're a runner, you need to run. If you like to knit, knit, you know, but whatever it is, take that time, whether it's, you know, a half hour of your day or whatever. This is what Dr. Roche was saying earlier. You really need to take a little bit of time for yourself and don't lose whatever it is that your passion is. Dr. Krilla? Thanks. Celine, I think that you can also make those things happen, much like the students make things happen, you know, and also it you'll develop your your own personal group of support, you know, your friends, your colleagues, sometimes your partners um, in practice, sometimes your partners in crime, maybe both. Um, but I think that, you know, sort of like Susan said, don't give up your passions. And if a little break in a day is something that could be created, or you have a strategy or an idea, don't be afraid to, to float it around or get some get a group together and do it for the for the well-being of yourself as well as the rest of the world. April. Hi. Um I just kind of had a question. I know we talked about good ways to um even like lower stress and just to manage and keep taking care of yourself and stuff, but I just wanted to know um what y'all thought about when you have particularly bad days like the really really bad ones that like I know we all have and thankfully I haven't had any since starting med school but like even when I used to work in the medical field beforehand there was just times where it was like everything you know gets taken out of you and then you try to do those daily living things and you just I don't know, sometimes it gets hard to take care of yourself and then you even just try to go to sleep and then it one day turns into all week, even though those aren't bad days, but you just can't catch up from that one day. Um, so what do you recommend for those particular days when things you just can't seem to catch a break? Um, I, I'm going to go out on a limb and let you know, when I was in school and in training, my father committed suicide devastated, devastated me, annihilated me, but I wasn't afraid to talk about it with my trainers and other people because I thought I couldn't ever get another day. Went and talked to someone and got a medication, really. Sometimes the stressors are so bad and you're expected to still continue to perform. And I was one of these people that grew up in the 60s, right? Or 70s, like, oh, just stiff upper lip, just manage it and take care of it. And what I realized is sometimes to make available use of all those resources. Is it okay to stay in bed one day because you had a bad day? Yes. Two days? Yes. But be realistic. Staying in bed for an entire week is a sign that something organic is going on and you need help. And it might be medication. It might be me talking to your program director or your teacher and taking a break away from it. That's allowed for you to gather your skills, harness your resources, and come back stronger. Um, medications are, are okay through medical school, right? They, they, they afford you the opportunity to be able to continue, but keep in the mind, in the back of your mind, you have stuff to work on and you're gonna work on it and you're gonna be successful. You're gonna surround yourself with support. Okay, anybody who's toxic to you, out of the picture from this day forward. <laughs> I don't know if anybody else has any suggestions. Uh, to kind of follow up with your saying though, is, you know, you'd be amazed by just, if you were to ask or talk to other people, how receptive, you know, people are in terms of helping you, because, you know, we all try to put up a front, every single one of us, and especially medical school, right? We want to make sure that we show a face to our friends, that we are strong in appearance. We have nothing going on, but there is a whole bunch that can be underlying. And by just talking to them, you know, you'd be amazed by just how supportive they are of you. And just to let you know, you'd be amazed in terms of just anyone, whether it's your faculty members, whether it's back when I would talk to Dr. Rosh, whether it's me um, speaking with my attendings, people have all experiences or at least most have in the past. And so it's not like you are have to be the only one. 
So by even asking, even for myself, even if you're to reach out to me, for instance, like I've been there before, I've had some very hard times, not trying to compare. We've all had really hard times, but still we're always, any one of us are happy to help you. Your schools, oh, it's David Tolentino. It's good to see everybody. Your schools have invested so much in terms of resources for safety, wellness, and health of their student and their faculty and their staff, and especially the students. Okay, so take advantage of those scenarios. I know a lot of what, uh, and I was, I'm sorry, I've been on audio and video mute because I was uh, driving home, but I was listening intently here to uh, Dr. Rasha's presentation and everything that she says here is, is very true, right? But sometimes finding your inner self and finding those things, sometimes that, it can be hard. So again, your schools have, have that, have those resources and you need to take advantage of them. Also, if something happens in patient care, right? If there's a, a, an unintended outcome, uh, something happens at the hospital, God forbids, active shoot or some kind of major, major situation that happens at the hospital. The hospitals are all trained. They have pastoral care departments. They also know to do a, um, essentially a debrief. You know how y'all do clinical skills and there's a debrief about, you know, how did this impact you? How did this make you feel? Would you change what you did and how you approach the, the standardized patient, right? They do the exact same thing when there are these sentinel situations at the hospital. I encourage y'all to uh, to participate in those. So whether you're a student or a resident, I want to say that when you're a resident, because you're a, technically an employee of the hospital, you're required to participate in those. But as a student, you know, they may say, all right, you know what, if you don't want to be here, that's fine. You can go. I'm going to tell y'all participate in those. All right. It can be very, very helpful to you. Yeah. You, you, Celine, you asked about what happens in the real world <clears throat> and you know, the support is still there. We debrief after codes, um, you know, because uh, people die and outcomes sometimes aren't good. And people have a tendency to blame themselves for somebody's death. And uh, it's good to kind of work through that. It, that's that's part of the process. Uh, we also, as employers, and I've been a chief medical officer of a large medical group, uh, we have a lot invested in every one of those physicians. And <clears throat> we don't want them to be unhappy. Uh, we certainly want them to, to uh, do well in their profession. So that that's out there. I mean, medicine has changed an awful lot over the last even 10 years. And um, yeah. much more sensitive to the situations that people at hand. So, something that struck stuck with me, Bob, when I went through my training, because internal medicine and patient patients die a lot, and um, especially I was training during the HIV era, and it was it, there were days I was devastated. But something a friend of mine who was a counselor said to me, and it's so true, and it, it helped me. So maybe it'll help me coming think about how could you ever think that you are in charge of who lives or dies? You're not. There's somebody else that handles that. You are not in charge. You are not the bottom line for people in their lives. Now, even if you make a mistake, you are the best option that that patient or that person has for you. And as long as you're functioning in good faith and doing the best and drawing on your resources and your opportunity, and it wasn't out of spite or malice that you neglected your care, or your duties, you have no control over outcomes and what they what happens. And always in medicine, it's a team approach. I can't tell you how many times I've written for the wrong medication and the pharmacist called me up and said, hey, uh, Dr. Rosh, didn't you see their alert? And I'm like, didn't see it. Thank you for saving me the, and the patient, right? We work together in teams and the nurses, if they come up and double check, are you sure you wanted to write for this medicine? to always embrace that opportunity. I know that um, we work together in teams, we, we take care of each other in teams. And I think that that's so important. So don't ever think you are so high and mighty and powerful that you are the ultimate person that decides the outcome of a situation. You'll have patients die on you, they have no idea. Like what, what was that? Did everything right? And then some that 
thrive under circumstances you could never even have thought possible. So. And it will go the other way too. You'll do things in which people die. And it's, you know, the, the, that's part of what we do. It's the risk and what we take. And um, a lot more good comes out of it than bad, but we always have to learn from our mistakes or from how we do things different the next time. Opportunities change. All right, anything else? Heavy topic. I'm gonna to go to a lighter topic. Um, so do I, I'm gonna share a screen. And I'm gonna try. There we go. Okay, so <laughs> what's this guy's problem? And so I need to have people chirping up because I can't see all the hands. Students, April, I'm gonna pick on you because you're the one I can see right now. <laughs> what's this guy's problem? I don't know. He looks pretty worried to me. So okay. All right. that could be maybe something psychiatric. Okay. Hannah? Um, I mean, it, it looks like his, maybe he has high blood pressure. He's getting his blood pressure checked and he doesn't look too happy about it. Okay. All right. Celine? I feel like he's well, from my angle, I mean, he can't, I don't think he can see what his blood pressure is at. So I feel like he's anticipating bad news, which could be his problem. Okay. Any other problems, Brianna? You're on mute, Brianna. There you go. Yeah, I was just, I mean, I feel like this is what you want to say, but I would say that potentially his weight might be a problem. His what problem? His weight. Wait, okay. Obesity. So, okay, all right. His tie may be too tight. <laughs> okay, it looks like he's trying to loosen it. I, th I think the blood pressure cuff is hurting him too much. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Michelle? Michelle, are you there? I'll go to Kelly. Kelly, can you help us out? What What do you see with this guy? All right, Grant. Kelly, Kelly answered on the chat, and okay. she thinks she thinks he may have white coat syndrome, which is a real thing. Okay, Grant. Any thoughts? Okay, I'll move to Savannah. Any thoughts about any more about this guy? Savannah also put in the chat that maybe he has a broken arm. He looks like he might be in pain. Okay. <laughs> so this guy's name's Joe. Joe's a 55 year old male and he's come to you for an executive physical. And uh, you guys are pretty good in your observations. He's, uh, if, if you had to make a diagnosis of this guy, Savannah, what would you say is your diagnosis? Let's see, hypertension, okay, could have hypertension. I'm trying to get through the names here. Morgan, what would your thoughts be? Um, potentially, if we were to measure his BMI, see where that lies, he could be in an obesity category, which could predispose him to some other risk factors that we would need to do more work up on. So what do you think his BMI is? Uh, I'm not good at guesstimating, maybe in the high, maybe in the 30s. Yeah, it's probably at least in the 30s. Christopher, do you have any thoughts about this guy? Diagnostically? Do any of you see anything that you would do that maybe is not all working so well here with this guy? Any errors? 
and the nurse or the doctor that's standing there with the blood pressure machine? I mean, it looks like they might have the screen turned towards him. So maybe turn that away. And <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Yeah. So this guy has hypertension, but what he really has is metabolic syndrome. Okay. Metabolic syndrome is all the stuff you see on the screen. He's heavy. He's got cholesterol problems. Um, you know. It's it's the condition of Americans that tends to kill most of us, indirectly or directly. So I thought it'd be kind of fun to talk about, you know, high blood pressure just a little bit, because you all ought to be, be able to take a good blood pressure at this stage of your game and understand what is high blood pressure. And these are the definitions from the American Heart Association. Uh, and to understand that blood pressure normal is less than 130. Actually, it's less than 120. But as we get a little older, we now stage it. So a stage one becomes greater than 130 and stage two, 140. And we kind of use 140 as kind of a thumbnail of treatment. Um, as to far as medication treatment is concerned and what national uh, thresholds look at as far as how they evaluate us. So old Joe here, when he was, um, when he was 15 years old, he went out for football and somebody took his blood pressure and his blood pressure was 124. And for a 15 year old, that maybe he's a little on the high side. Then he went, graduated from high school, and he's going to go to college, and he take his blood pressure, and it's 128. And then he gets a job, and someplace around mid-30, he gets another job, goes in for a physical, and now it's 140. And all along here, no one has really done anything. And he's 50, he goes in for a physical, and his blood pressure is 155, and he say, oh, it's white coat hypertension. So they did nothing. At age 60, he goes into the doctor and, oh, my goodness, it's 160. We have to do something. And so then he gets treated with medication. This is kind of the life story of hypertension, not just Joe. It's most people with high blood pressure. It starts in youth and nothing is done until we hit some sort of red line. And then we want to take some action. And quite frankly, the horse is out of the barn by then. So by the time we get out here with the red dots at, the damage to his cardiovascular system is already done. And the reason I'm bringing all of this up is that you all have an opportunity to talk to your future patients, your patients now, way back in here when lifestyle changes make a difference. What would be some of the lifestyle changes that you would expect? Lowering sodium in the diet. Okay, low sodium diet. How low would you lower it? Anybody have an idea what the number would be? How many milligrams of sodium the American Heart or the American Hypertensive Association recommends? Ooh. I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. So the recommendation uh, for for hypertension for, for sodium is someplace less than 1,800 milligrams uh, of sodium. Now that seems like that would be quite a bit, but considering the Amer average American male and probably Joe here is consuming three to 4,000 milligrams a day. One slice of cheese pizza is about 800 milligrams. So half your daily allotment of sodium if your hypertension is in that one slice of pizza. Sorry, I didn't want to ruin anybody's supper tonight. What else might we want to do for Joe? What else would lifestyle changes be? Christopher, you got an idea?
Any other thoughts? Some people have said stuff in the chat, like uh, exercise, um, okay. make sure they're getting quality sleep. Okay, good, good points. I mean, Anything also else? on the topic, sorry, on the topic of today, stress, cortisol, keep it low. Okay. Anything else? Any chemicals that we ingest that might make a difference? Less caffeine. I know Dr. Roche isn't going to like that, but. She's going to like it. I know she's going to like it. Oh. Yeah. So if people are telling you how many pots of coffee they're drinking, rather than how many cups of coffee they're drinking, there's a huge difference. Okay. So caffeine is a big player in all of this. All right. So the other thing that was wrong back in Joe's, if you go back here just real quickly, look at that blood pressure cuff. One, it's in the wrong position, way down in his arm. And it's certainly not the right size. A blood pressure cuff should be about 70 to 80% of the length of the, of the uh, humerus. And, uh, you know, this is a study that was done relatively recently demonstrating that the wrong size cuff makes a heck of a difference. The cuff is too small, and I don't mean how far it wraps around his arm. I'm talking about the length of the cuff to the, to the humerus. It will make a huge difference in blood pressure response. And so one of the reasons the blood pressure looks too high is that the cuff is too small. So taking a, a proper blood pressure is really important in making the diagnosis and getting op op adequate treatment. So the cuff should cover the upper part of the arm at least one time, check on both arms. The last patient I saw today with our student, uh, blood pressure was great in the right arm, but on the left arm, it was like 150. Well, there's a big difference between the right and left arm as far as the anatomy is concerned. And most likely this guy probably has a subclavian stenosis. His blood pressure is actually too high. If you just check the right arm all the time, you're going to miss hypertension. Setting the feet on the floor, keeping your cuff at arms at heart level. Why would I care about the bell of the stethoscope? I'm going to pick on the resident. John Arthur, tell me why the bell is what we should be using. Oh, I put him on the spot. No, no, no worries. Hold on. Can you repeat that for me? Why would we want to use the bell of the stethoscope? Well, either it could be from... Watch this, everyone. This is where I'm going to get stuff wrong, too. So no, I just me... helped you here. Oh, nice. Okay. <laughs> so there's five phases of Krotkov. Krotkov is an old Russian guy, the Russian guy, that... Um, just determine indirect blood pressure measurements. Remember what we're checking on blood pressures are indirect measurements. And the five phases of Krotkov is phase one, where you hear the heart, you, you hear the uh, high pitch sound. Phase two, it gets to be a soft sound or a blowing sound. Phase three, it gets, it's harder again. So phase one is the systolic blood pressure. Phase two is when it softens. And if you have, if you're using a diaphragm, you may miss that low pitch sound and come down on phase three, in which case you're going to miss the systolic hypertension, systolic blood pressure. That's one reason you may see differences between what a nurse may do or with a machine rather than what you get with your stethoscope. So look those up and be aware of Krotkov sounds. Oops. One of the problems we have in our country is that our hypertensive population is about 30% of the blood of the population, but only 80% uh, of those people are diagnosed and about half are controlled. About 20% of the population is totally unaware that they have high blood pressure. So just be aware. We don't do a very good job with one of the easiest things in the world to treat that we can make a difference in people's lives. And y'all can be doing stuff right now as students. So. Joe gets treatment. He gets all this. Why is his pressure still high? 
And so you have to think about things like uh, sleep apnea or calcified arteries or some sort of secondary hypertension, uh, or he's just not being treated adequately. So think about high blood pressure. This is one of those areas that a student can do something about and monitor people. It's an essential part of hypertension, and it's one of the most important parts um, that we can do that makes a difference in people's lives. It's even more important than treating diabetes and a variety of other diseases. And it starts way young when lifestyle changes make a difference. So there, it's eight o'clock and you guys get, get, go home with something, two things you can do. One, be nice and kind to each other. And two, get people to follow their low sodium diet and stay away from pots of coffee.